It is episode 108 of Decoding Fox News, and I'm your host, Juliet Jeske. Each week, I watch and analyze a whole heck of a lot of Fox News and break it down. I watch all the Fox News you'd never want to. This past week, it was 15 hours. Let's get into it. Fox News, celebrities who almost love MAGA, and the damn dirty Democrat earthquake. It would have been far easier for J.K. Rowling to back away from her views on transgenderism. (laughs) The author of Harry Potter winning a big battle over free speech. J.K. Rowling daring cops in Scotland to jail her for criticizing transgender ideology. What does Kid Rock think about Trump's chances in November? What do you think is going to happen in Michigan, though? I mean, your home state going to wake up and decide... No moss. We're not. We're not. We're not going to kill our auto Trump's industry with Michigan. EVs, and he's going to win it. Tr- Trump's winning. Trump's winning Michigan. I'm- Arnold Schwarzenegger joining Travis and Jason Kelsey on their New Heights podcast. The bodybuilder turned actor turned politician, crediting America for his success story. To me, coming to America was the key to my success. It's just a place where foreigners. Uh, welcomed, and this is the key thing, if you are willing to contribute yeah. to America. There's a lot of people that want to come to America to take advantage of America, and I am very vividly against that. Hasta la vista, law-breaking migrants. Arnold Schwarzenegger flexing on the invasion of criminal illegal aliens running amok in America. Shakira revealing her kids were not big fans of the Barbie movie. The singer tell- Shakira is blasting Barbie for diminishing men. The pop star saying, quote, my sons absolutely hated it. About Shakira said, you know, she the Barbie movie, she took her sons and, you know, really kind of trashed the movie. They felt that it was emasculating. Dwayne The Rock Johnson tells us in an exclusive interview, actually to Will, how he really feels four years after endorsing President Joe Biden. The Rock is delivering a smackdown on the Biden campaign. Dwayne Johnson is refusing to back Joe Biden this year after lending his endorsement in the last election. The superstar dropped kicking the sorry state of Biden's America while speaking with Fox and Friends. So I honestly admit I didn't really notice this trend of the celebrities with grievances until the end of the week. And I looked back and I went, you know, they brought up a lot of people. That was really odd because I'm not really sure why, because not all of those roads led to Trump. In fact, only one did, and that was Kid Rock. So here we go. Last week, Fox News featured a cavalcade of celebrities with grievances from a Latina pop star, a children's book author, a couple of international movie stars, a comedian, and an aging rapper turned country star as proof of a MAGA revolution that really wasn't much of anything. The Colombian singer Shakira said her young sons didn't like the record-breaking film Barbie. UK author J.K. Rowling promoted her usual criticism of trans women. Actor Michael Rapoport, who I have no idea who he is, I just, just full disclosure, said he was angry with Joe Biden because the president wasn't supporting Israel. And Arnold Schwarzenegger made a vague remark about immigrants. The biggest blow to Joe Biden came from the actor and wrestler Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who said he wouldn't endorse Biden for president in 2024 as he had in 2020. During the same interview, the megastar didn't endorse or offer any praise for former President Donald J. Trump. And they tried, but he did not. He did not. They tried. Will Cain tried to lure that out of him. Didn't happen. Johnson appeared on the network to promote his return to professional wrestling via the WWE, which is part of Fox Sports. So the only celebrity who enthusiastically sang the praises of Trump was the former rapper, if you want to call him that, turned country singer, if you want to call him that, Kid Rock, a longtime supporter and sometimes golf buddy of the former president. Rock famously bragged that Trump showed him maps of North Korea and asked his opinion about strategies to deal with a hostile nation. Kid Rock also donned a Budweiser branded cap while appearing on the Ingram Angle, while failing to mention that Bush Light, a Budweiser brand, is a major sponsor of his latest music tour. Rock famously fired a semi-automatic rifle at cases of Bud Light beer as a form of protest after the beer company partnered with Dylan Mulvaney 
a trans influencer. And I want to point out, because I didn't really notice this because I'm not really a gun person, uh, that people who know things about guns all made fun of the fact that although he tried to shoot like four uh, inanimate static objects, which would be cases of Bud Light, with a semi-automatic weapon, you know, just lots of rounds, powerful, only two of them remained standing when he was finished. I didn't realize that's pretty pathetic because it's beer. It's not moving. It's not gonna. It's not gonna dart out of the way. And you have a semi-automatic weapon. You think it wouldn't take much effort, right? How much does that case of beer really weigh? Not much. It's aluminum, for Christ's sake. Aluminum. Have you ever seen aluminum in a fire? Throw an aluminum can in a fire. It's fun. It just whew, gone. Just come, almost like melts. Aluminum, not the toughest metal. Cart, thin cardboard, and you ha it's stationary. It's not running away, okay, Kid Rock? Yet, you, when you were finished after did -a -did -a -did -a -did -a -did two boxes still just looking at you with shame. With shame, Kid Rock! I can't stand him. Anyway, I can't stand him because he's like fake blue collar. He's fake blue collar. He's like from money. His parents own like horses in an orchard and a tennis court and they're a, like a state. And he acts like he's like from the streets. No, you're not. So anyway... Fox News also whipped up fear and paranoia about the border crisis, spent a lot of time, oddly, trashing trans Americans, and strangely figured out a way to make an earthquake about corrupt Democrats. The damn dirty Democrat earthquake. Anyone watching a lot of Fox News last week would probably have missed out on countless updates in the Israel-Hamas war and the war in Ukraine or Biden's commitment to strengthening U.S. relations with Japan amid furthering tensions between China and its neighbors. A lot of news happened last week that Fox just didn't mention. As always, shows I covered, Fox and Friends, The First Hour, The Five, and The Ingram Angle. So let's get into this stupid story. I hate celebrity stories about nothing, and this is one of them. But I, I kind of relented. I didn't, I saw this clip and just went, meh. And then other people clipped it and it blew up. And then people kept mentioning it on Twitter and other social media platforms. And I'm like, <sighs> I got to talk about it. I don't want to. I don't want, I don't care about Dwayne The Rock Johnson. But my personal feelings on this wrestler turned actor are not important here. If millions of people commented on this stupid clip, I should talk about it. That's just, <laughs> I kind of had this moment with myself where I'm like, you have to, you have to include this. So um, what happened basically was Dwayne The Rock Johnson uh, agreed to meet with Wayne, Will Kane, who sort of used to have like a sports background. So they had him interview uh, The Rock and they were in some arena and they're talking about how the, the interview was really about how Dwayne The Rock Johnson was coming back to wrestling at the age of 51. It's a little crazy because, you know, injuries and, and whatnot. He's going to come back to wrestling where he got his start in his career. His whole family is heavily invested in wrestling. His grandmother was a wrestling promoter. His father was a wrestler. His daughter is now a wrestler. He's going to come back to this. I don't know really why. He's got plenty of money. But he wants to come back to wrestling and do that thing. Okay. So he's promoting it. And they talked about mostly that. And then at one point, uh, the conversation pivoted to his endorsement of Biden in the 2020 election. And this is what... Uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson said. Am I happy with the state of America right now? Well, that answer is no. Do I believe we're going to get better? I, I believe in that. I'm an optimistic guy, and I, I believe we can get better. The endorsement that I made uh, years ago with Biden was one I thought was the best decision for me at that time. Am I going to do that again this year? That answer is no. I'm not going to do that because what I realized, what that caused back then was something that tears me up in my guts back then and now, which is division. Now, his comment was rather vague. He just said he wasn't happy with how the country's going right now. He didn't talk about uh, Biden specifically. He didn't say, I don't like this or this or this. Didn't talk about inflation, didn't talk about the economy, didn't talk about, that was it. That's the whole comment. Um, he, people took that as incredibly anti-Biden. Some people did. Some people took that as like a tepid, kind of unspoken endorsement for Trump, which it was not. He specifically did not endorse Trump, nor did he talk about Trump. He didn't praise Trump 
in any way, shape, or form. Um, and to me, honestly, it seemed more like a person who realized he upset at least half his fans, if not more, when he endorsed Biden and regretted it. That's how it came across to me, because he talked about division and how it upset people. I know at some point in his career, people were actually pushing him to go into politics and he talked about it. And I think he realized that he probably doesn't want to do that because if you talk about upsetting people, that would do it. Um, certain jobs, you just have to have a very thick skin about people hating you. One of them is journalism. Um, seriously, I'm not kidding. It kind of is, depending on what type of journalism you go into. You get People just come at us. People come at journalists, let me tell you. Um, another one would be politics. Anything with politics, people are going to get very angry with you. And they're going to come at you and criticize you. So certain jobs, you just have to deal with that. And movie stars, I think, like praise, like adoration, probably wasn't crazy about people yelling at him and screaming at him and angry emails, the whole nine yards. Um, so anyway, that's what he said. And, of course, Fox tried to turn that into a Trump endorsement, which it was not. And Steve Ducey, same broadcast, made this statement. What was I thinking? Well, remember the actor Rappaport, he was on the beaches of Tel Aviv saying mm -hmm. he was not going to support, he wasn't going to vote for Joe Biden. Now you hear The Rock saying he is not going to endorse him this time. Well, well what Rappaport said that was uh, voting for Trump is on the table. Uh, it, it's interesting what he said, he, and he doesn't say he's not going, uh, we're talking now about, I'm talking just now things about, are going this, bad. about The Rock. Uh, he doesn't say he's not going to vote for uh, Joe Biden next time. Uh, what he's, he's saying is he took, uh, I think, in reading what he said and watching Will's interview, and we got more of the Will interview coming up, I think he just took a lot of heat. And, Brian, to your point, you know, if the country is half and half, uh, half the country didn't like the fact that he said uh, vote for the other guy. And so all he's saying is I'm not going to tell you who I'm going to vote for. He's just not going to endorse well, anybody. He's not uh, saying I'm going to you know, vote for Trump or I'm not going to vote for Biden. He's just saying I'm not going to tell anybody what I'm going well, to do. Not now, regulars of this podcast definitely would identify that clip as a Steve Ducey goes rogue, which it very much is. That's very much a Steve Ducey goes rogue. Subtle. It's a subtle one. He's not openly fighting, but he's pointing out the obvious, which I saw immediately. Um, and... Ironically, just want to mention this. The reason why I make bits like Steve Ducey goes rogue is due to the influence of professional wrestling in my life. I have two brothers, one older, one younger. I grew up blue collar. I grew up in Missouri. There was a lot of professional wrestling shtick in my life. A lot. I know all about the Van Erics. I know all about nature boy Ric Flair. Woo! Uh, Andre the Giant. Hulk Hogan, let's do this. Let's do this. Okay, so, but oddly, I never got into The Rock because he's like, he kind of came up after I, my brother stopped caring when I was an adult. Basically, I'm too close in age to The Rock, so I don't know anything about him, really, other than he's been in a bunch of movies. I don't know. I don't have much of an opinion about him. That's why I didn't really care about that clip. And then I saw it blow up, and I was like, ah, got to cover this. But I do because I do. But here's why I don't get that worked up about celebrities with uh, political endorsements is I don't think they move the needle much. I just don't. I don't think there's a guy out there who's like, I was going to vote for Trump. But then Dwayne The Rock Johnson said I should vote for Biden. So that's it. I'm, it's over. I'm voting for Biden. I just don't. I don't know how much sway somebody like Dwayne The Rock Johnson has over the electorate. We've seen that when Trump endorses someone, that does have an effect. We've seen when Representative Clyburn endorsed Biden, that had a huge effect. We know that some endorsements matter and some endorsements don't. And I just don't think there's a lot of Dwayne The Rock Johnson voters out there who just hang on. What is he going to tell me about politics? I just, I just don't think they care. So yes, it was just like sort of this bizarre collection of celebrities who made comments that were like slightly right of center that Fox tried to blow up. And my, even Michael Rappaport, who was like angry, angry, angry at Biden, did not say, but I love Trump. Even he didn't. And I don't know who Michael Rappaport is. He looked familiar to me, but I could not place him in anything I'd ever seen. I was like, I, I've probably seen him in something. I don't know who that guy is. If they, they, Yeah, okay. 
And I get it. He's angry about Israel. You know, he was in Israel when he made the comment. I just went, okay, I don't, you know, good for you. Um, next up, we have another migrant caravan is a coming. Now, this is actually from the week prior to last week because I got it at the very tail end of Friday. But they kept acting like this caravan was going to happen April 1st on the Monday. And then, of course, they immediately dropped it. And here are the clips. The first one is from Fox and Friends. And the second one, same night, is from Hannity, where Jason Chaffetz was subbing for Hannity. A migrant caravan headed towards the U.S. southern border. The group of about 2,000 people formed on Monday near Mexico's border with Guatemala. The caravan is expected to arrive in El Paso, Texas in just a few days. This as another 200 National Guard troops have been deployed uh, to that border city. In Atlanta. The New York Post is reporting that thousands of migrants are headed, heading towards El Paso in just the latest caravan. And right now, we're expecting that group to start arriving on Monday, a good portion of that group. But don't expect them to arrive as a full 2,000. What they're expecting is groups of 10 to 30. So that was Sarah Carter, and she's a regular Fox News contributor. She's not actually a correspondent. There is a difference. But she's a regular Fox News contributor. Hannity has her on a lot, like a lot. And basically what she was just saying there is this big, scary caravan of 2,000 people will enter the country in groups of 10 to 30. And I just went, what? So that's a caravan? So 2,000 people were going to rush to the border. And they kept showing images of, like, this group of people rushing to the border. And yet when they get there, they're going to enter the country in groups of 10 to 30. So is that a caravan? Or is it just every day at the border? I'm confused. But yeah, no, no kidding. And they're like, it's coming on Monday, Monday, Monday. And then Monday, do you think they talked about this? They did not. Completely dropped it. But we did have an earthquake last week. And that was funny because I have lived in New York for 23 years. I was here during the last earthquake in 2011, which wasn't as strong, but I was in an older building. So I, I felt it more. I was in a pre-war building. So I immediately knew what it was when we had the earthquake. And I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> I was like, let's do it again. <laughs> it was kind of my attitude of like, wow. And then when we had the aftershock at six, I was like, oh, oh, do we get another aftershock? And part of the reason why I was excited is because I knew based on the news that like nobody had gotten hurt and there had been no major damage. So I was like, this is fun and exciting. Let's do it again. But um, Fox News, this is from the five... And I just went, oh, come on, just stop, just stop. This is from Friday. This is this was their take on it. Just, oh, my goodness. But leave it to liberal New York to screw up the response. It took the geniuses who run the city's emergency alert system nearly 40 minutes to blast out one of those high-pitched, super annoying phone alerts. But hey, they are. Imagine at least if the me media were just as affected by real calamities, whether it is a border or it's a crime wave or it's inflation. Hey, I don't eat at McDonald's. Why do I care? But, oh, my God, my bookshelves, they shook in my two-story walk-up. Oh, my God, someone call an expert on earthquakes. Nobody was freaking out. Speaking of the view, those earthquake things go off in their studio all the time. Whenever oh. anybody crosses their legs... The Rag. whole place just shakes. <laughs> that was a little scary. But I will say, I'm just glad that there wasn't enough damage for the, the Clinton Foundation to swoop in and cause even more problems. I explained to Jesse it. Jr., he asked me, well, mm. Dad, well, what is an earthquake? Wow. And I just think tectonic plates, mm. and that's all I know. Do you know the Richter scale? S no. So I, I, said, <laughs> I, said, I said, Earth is hungry. You know when you get hungry and your oh, stomach you starts growling? To your son. Yes. And then I said, okay. so we need to feed Earth. So we went out, we took a sausage, and we shoved it oh, into the ground. You are. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, we're fine, America. We're Thank fine. God. Don't worry. And that is the most popular cable news show in the country. That. That clip came from the most popular news program in the country. That's on at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so I have no idea who the heck is watching. But a lot of retirees are sit glued, glued to their set. Like, Jesse Waters buried a sausage in his backyard. Greg Gutfeld was mad that a natural disaster even happened.
We haven't had an earthquake of that uh, intensity in 140 years. And he's like, you know, why aren't we talking about inflation? I don't know, idiot, because we had a very unusual event that never happens. And 41 million people felt it. 41 million. East Coast is densely populated. Apparently the way the plates are in the ground. I don't know anything about seismic adventures, but the way the plates are on the East Coast... When there's an earthquake, a lot of people feel it across a much broader uh, track of land than they would on the West Coast. So, yeah, big deal, because this never happens. And Greg Gutfeld's whining about stuff. And then Katie Pavlich brings up the Clinton Foundation. What on earth is going on here? Like, really? We're doing this. Now, with all of that nonsense, the one thing I will give them, although I suspect that Jesse Waters did not actually write this himself, Someone wrote it for him because he read it off a teleprompter. But yes, uh, easily, I don't think it was 40 minutes. It felt closer to 30 minutes after the earthquake. We all got this annoying alert on our phones from the city of New York that was like, by the way, we just had an earthquake. And I was like, way to go. You're on it. You're on it, Eric Adams. You're on it. Now, (laughs) I'm making fun of how stupid that was. And then I made a joke on Twitter because I'm dark and, you know morbidity is my thing but um i know for a fact because i grew up in the cold cold war that it takes about a half an hour for an intercontinental ballistic missile from russia to hit new york city half hour so if russia just was you know like that's it we're done we're over it let's go out with a blaze of glory and they fired an icbm at new york city it would hit and then after everything was over our phones would go bing By the way, um, we're about to be hit with an ICBM. And be like, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Eric Adams. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now, this next clip is Matt Whitaker, who was the acting attorney general under President Trump. And that was kind of a revolving door because near the end of the Trump administration, a bunch of people kept resigning and it was very nutty. And Whitaker was one of the true diehard like believers in Trump. And he has made this same claim before. And I hasten, I don't like to use the term lie. I don't like to for legal liability purposes. And it's also very difficult to prove anyone is knowingly lying. So I'm just going to say he misrepresents the Presidential Records Act and doesn't seem to quite understand the Clinton sock drawer controversy. So I'm going to play the clip and then we're going to break it down. It's what they're trying to get at is this Presidential Records Act argument, which is ultimately the Clinton sock drawer case, right? I mean, Bill Clinton had personal recordings in his sock drawer. A court determined that they were his personal records. It didn't matter if they were classified. It didn't matter anything because Bill Clinton had determined after his presidency they were his personal records. Donald Trump has done the same thing. He said, these documents are my personal records. If you read the Presidential Records Act, Brian... It says all documents. It doesn't carve out defense intelligence information. It doesn't carve out classified marked information. It says all records are presidential and then it has a process. And so I've caught Whitaker doing this like twice in the past month. And both times I've clipped it, stuck it on Twitter and it's blown up both times. Now, that's not how the Presidential Records Act worked. It's not up to the president to decide what's personal and what's not at all. It's actually completely the opposite. Nearly everything is considered uh, like a part of the archives. Almost everything the president touches is part of the archives. However, in this case, what happened is Bill Clinton was president. He got approached by a historian named Taylor Branch to create an oral history of his presidency from 1993 to 2001. So there's a series of interviews. They were recorded probably on little tapes. I'm betting those little mi- micro tapes back then is what they probably would have used. And they had these conversations about his presidency. And at some point, uh, Bill Clinton took these tapes and kept them in his sock drawer at home. The book, after Clinton had left office, came out. And then Judicial Watch, which is a conservative group that like kind of targets all kinds of things on the left, tried to sue to say that those tapes were part of uh, the National Archives because they wanted to listen to them. They thought, ha-ha, we'll get dirt on Clinton. So they tried to sue to get those put in his library so they would be available to the public. And Clinton countersued and was like, no, they have nothing to do with anything classified. And the court agreed with Clinton. 
And that was it. But it wasn't up to Clinton to say that this is personal and therefore it's not classified. No, it just wasn't classified. Um, so this is me reading directly from the Presidential Records Act. In 1978, Congress passed the Presidential Records Act, which states that any records created or received by the president as part of his constitutional, statutory, or ceremonial duties are the property of the United States government and will be managed by NARA at the end of the administration. The Presidential Records Act requires the president to separate personal documents from presidential records before leaving office. The PRA makes clear that upon conclusion of the president's term in office, NARA assumes responsibility for the custody, control, preservation of, and access to the records of a president. The PRA makes the legal status of presidential records clear and unambiguous, providing that the United States reserves and retains complete ownership, possession, and control of presidential records. There is no history, practice, or provision in law for presidents to take official records with them when they leave office to sort through, such as a two-year period as described in some reports. If a former president or vice president finds presidential records among personal materials, he or she is expected to contact NARA in a timely manner to secure the transfer of those presidential records to NARA. Now, Whitaker specifically said any records, which is in the first sentence of the PRA, but it basically says the exact opposite of what he just said. It basically says that almost everything is considered NARA's. And, and if anything is personal, it's up to the president to sort it out and there is a process to declassify things, which is a whole other thing, which he did not mention. Whitaker did not mention declassification. Um, but yeah, no, it actually says the exact opposite of what he just implied. It actually said that, no, pretty much everything is considered NARA's. And you're talking about confidential classified military records. How on earth is that a personal document? It's not just the president goes, personal. Ha ha. That's personal. I get to keep it. That's what he sort of implied. And that is not correct. And of course, recordings of an interview is not classified information. So that's absolutely ridiculous. Now, at this point, this is about halfway through. I'm going to give a shout out to my sponsor. And that sponsor would be the listeners of this podcast and readers of my newsletter. I have no large sponsor, no large uh, benefactor, uh, no uh, advertisers, absolutely nothing. It is hundreds of people subscribing at a rate of five dollars a month some people give a little bit more on patreon and all of my paid subscribers and paid supporters get exclusive content now this past weekend i was working on something that i made a huge mistake on and accidentally deleted a bunch of footage and i have to redo it i was going to have it for you guys sunday night and i screwed up and accidentally destroyed it <laughs> it's a long story of how that happened uh it's based on some old tucker carlson today episodes that I've been working my way through, all 262 of them. So I should have that soon. I'm going to hopefully re-record it. And another way you can help the project is by sharing the podcast, share the newsletter, especially if you do so on social media, that helps tremendously. Give me a good review on whatever platform you're listening to. That also helps tremendously. I have a high review right now. I haven't checked it in a while. I get very weird about checking it because I get like neurotic. Um, <laughs> I'm just like, it's fine. It's fine. Just keep going. Um, anyway, so the other next topic is, um, and this was very distressing for me because I have a trans cousin. I have a few trans friends, transgender friends. I'm not really sure why, um, Fox News has decided to target the trans community as aggressively as they have, but the network really is vicious towards, uh, trans people. Uh, last week, they uh, featured a lot of segments about trans women in sports or trans girls in, you know, school sports. And I know that's a contentious issue, uh, but then they would find ways to just make these segments also about just the trans community in general. And Greg Gutfeld, for reasons I do not understand, uh, finds ways to bring up the issue of transgender people or transgenderism whenever possible, even when they're not even talking about it. They'll be talking about Israel and he'll find a way to talk about transgender people. And I just sit back and go, why do you keep bringing this up? It's kind of bizarro that you bring it up when it's not even part of the conversation. So this was Greg Gutfeld working this into a conversation that was on Tuesday on the five. And I just want to preface this. Greg Gutfeld has no uh, background as a therapist or psychology or medicine or anything like that. 
he got his start in magazine publishing and he kind of worked in that for a hot minute and then sort of weaseled his way into Fox and then ended up as a self-proclaimed comedian. I don't think he worked comedy clubs and did it the hard way. It's just, what are you, why are you so obsessed with trans people? I don't get it. I think Fox News has decided to pick on them because they can't really pick on gay people as easily as they used to, um, gay and lesbian and bisexual people as easily. So they've decided trans people are their new group that they're going to target. And it's really ugly to watch this. It's really ugly, especially, um, I, I just don't, I don't get the hate. I don't get where the hate comes from. And then they try to say that they're child molesters, which is absurd. Uh, it's just gross. And this is his comment. And again, it, it's just coming from complete ignorance, in my humble opinion, complete and utter ignorance. What, what has happened here is the trans activism has been basically controlled by narcissistic men with gynophilia. These are guys that get off wearing women's clothing. They are not attractive. They're not trans. They're just dudes in dresses. And they have a desire to see themselves as women. And now, for some reason, if you, uh, if you do not indulge a man's fetish, then somehow you are offending his identity. She's just by saying that they are men, that is attacking their identity. See, I would love, they never have this on the five, but I would love to have an actual doctor who uh, understands sort of what's going on with a trans person and understands the, because there's, there's been a lot of research on it that it actually uh, originates in the womb at some point. And for some reason, they don't quite understand the, the uh, wires get crossed as far as gender and gender identification. So the person is born one gender, but they don't, they don't feel like they match it. And I know people who've uh, been trans, openly trans, complete with hormone therapy for 20, 30 years. And there was no regrets on their part. So I, I'm very confused by this. And everybody I know has transitioned as an adult and been very, very happy with their choices. So I have a trans cousin. So I'm just very like, I don't get it. I don't get the hate towards these people. I don't understand the venom. I don't understand the anger. And I, yeah, I would just love to see a conversation between somebody who actually knows something about this topic and somebody like Greg Gutfeld. Uh, the next up is Jesse Waters also making incredibly ignorant, in my opinion, bigoted comments about trans people. These people are just gay or lesbian. And what they're doing is they're intervening in a regular gay or lesbian life. And that's a new experience. And it never used to be like that. So I seriously doubt that either Jesse Waters or Greg Gutfeld, uh, maybe Greg Gutfeld, he, he tries to pretend that he is some sort of expert on this. But so according to the American Psychiatric Association, and I have a hyperlink in the newsletter that will take you to sort of the history of trans people. Um, the term transgender wasn't coined until the 1960s, but evidence of transgender, non-binary and gender fluid people um, have been documented throughout history and across cultures throughout the world. And this is true. If you go back to some of like the oldest things ever written down by human beings, you will find evidence of people who either didn't like, you know, align with the gender they were at birth or were somewhere in between the two genders. They just identified as something like, I'm not male, I'm not female, I'm this. Okay. So again, across every culture. You'll, you'll also find gay people across every culture all over the world. So I just kind of go, if this is true, I think this is just a, another way of being human. I don't think that this is that big of a deal. I don't think we should be freaking out. That's just my two cents. And I just, I just hate hearing that bigoted comments. But I had to bring that up because it was a major, major topic last week on Fox. And I'm like, here we go again with the trans people. Here we go again. You know what I would love to see is I would love to see, and I, I there probably is somebody who does her somewhere. Uh, if I were a gay man and I was like a slight gay man, like, like petite, like small boned, I would love to see a gay man do, you know who I'm going to say, you know who I'm going to say right now is Judge Janine. Wouldn't it be funny to see a drag version of Judge Janine? She'd come out with a box of wine and a straw. And she'd say, shut up, I'm gonna, here's the thing. And another thing, I'm gonna tell you right now. Forget it, listen. 
What we need to do is we need to lock them up. Just you. I'm going to lock you up. You, I'm going to lock you up. Stop talking to me. We need consequences. You're a criminal. I used to be a judge. Can I tell you how many times I run for office at this point? And here's the bottom line. I work for Fox. Okay, she has a couple of sayings. Here's the bottom line. Here's the thing. Um, lock them up. And then she talks about her dogs, Oreo cookies, and York peppermint patties. That's her shtick. Okay, and she loves your dogs. This woman loves your dogs, and I respect that. Now, last week, as Fox was spending a lot of time focusing on these kind of random comments by famous and not-so-famous celebrities and putting a lot of effort towards transgender Americans, not sure why that was so pressing, but that's what they were doing, uh, PBS's number one topic was the Israel-Hamas war, which I think is a little bit more important to cover. Um, considering a lot has happened in the past week with that conflict. And I wanted to address a fairly horrible incident that just happened um, because I'm going to do a direct comparison of how PBS reported on it and how Fox reported on it. And Fox likes to show itself, or present itself, I should say, as an advocate for Israel. But the way Fox is... Uh, pretends it's an advocate for Israel. And I say pretends because they ignore Israel pretty much all the time until there's a conflict and then they act like rah, rah, Israel, but they don't ever report on anything that happens over there. They ignore all of the political divisions in Israel. They just don't report on it. They act as if Bibi Netanyahu is wildly popular when he is not. Uh, they pretend that there's no uh, divisions in Israel whatsoever, that, that everybody's unified and they're all like, yay, that's not true. Um, and they generally just ignore the conflict and only kind of use it as a cudgel to go against Biden and to criticize Biden. And they're very vicious towards pro-Palestine protesters, which I think is sort of a spectrum on that one, because some of them are more radicalized than others. Um, so this is how the two networks, and we're going to start with Fox first, covered an Israeli attack that killed seven humanitarian aid workers who were employed by the world's central kitchen. And that is a international charity uh, that's run by a celebrity chef. And um, they have helped out in Ukraine and helped out all over the world. And um, what's so tragic about this is seven people were killed uh, and they had communicated with the Israeli government and the IDF like, we are humanitarian aid workers. You know who we are. Our car is marked. We're going to go from here to here. We're delivering food aid. And somebody made a mistake somewhere, according to the IDF, and accidentally struck this car and killed everybody in it. Uh, and it, apparently there's more than one attack on these cars. So I'm just going to play the clips and then sort of break it down. So this is how Fox Central Kitchen is suspending operations across the Middle East after seven of its workers were killed in what's believed to be an Israeli airstrike, the IDF responding to the tragedy just moments ago. We also express sincere sorrow to our allied nations who have been doing and continue to do so much to assist those in need. We have been reviewing the incident in the highest levels to understand the circumstances of what happened and how it happened. So that is a 30 second, the reason why you hear that music underneath that is a headline news segment, that is a 30 second segment, that's it. That's all that Fox dedicated to the story on the shows that I covered. Now, if you watch uh, Brett Baer or Neil Cavuto, the more legit news programs, they probably spent more time on that, but I don't cover those those shows I cover the opinion shows the more popular shows that's it nobody else talked about this nobody else mentioned it 30 seconds that's all Fox dedicated to it now PBS NewsHour had multiple segments multiple mentions about this incident the attack happened on April 1st and these segments started on April 2nd and again this is from the same day two different networks this is PBS's coverage Overnight, Israel killed seven members of the charity World Central Kitchen, one Palestinian and six foreigners, including one dual American-Canadian, as well as an Australian and Europeans. The president of the U.S. called the group's founder, the chef Jose Andres, to express his heartbreak. 
Israel called the killings unintended and vows to investigate. Nick Schifrin begins our coverage. In the words of the World Central Kitchen, this was a targeted attack. A direct hit on the group's armored vehicle, incinerating everything and everyone inside. So I'll briefly describe what they show on the screen. Um, on Fox, they showed the top of the car that had a huge crater, like a hole, from the missile strike or the that hit the car. Uh, PBS went ahead and showed you the inside of the car, and everything was burned out. It was just ash, ash and twisted metal. All that was left intact, a metal plate with the group's logo. They came here from all over the world to feed the hungry. They leave in the white body bags borne by this war's more than 30,000 victims. Among them, the group's Palestinian driver, Saif Abu Taha. This was all a mistake, said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. So there they show a very brief clip of what looks like a funeral service for the Palestinian driver. And there are people praying around his body in a body bag that's partially zipped up. And then the next clip is Bibi Netanyahu making an official statement. Unfortunately, in the last day, there was a tragic incident of an unintended strike of our forces on innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in war. We are checking this thoroughly. We are in touch with the government, and we will do everything for this not to happen again. But World Central Kitchen says it coordinated with the Israeli military as a convoy left its warehouse in Deir el by the sea in central Gaza. Israeli munitions hit an initial vehicle. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz reports that World Central Kitchen workers then moved to another vehicle that was struck and then a third vehicle that was struck as they traveled on or next to the coastal road that Israel designates for humanitarian aid. Well, the first uh, initial segment on the news hour was four and a half minutes long. I don't have time to play the full four and a half minutes. That would be kind of excessive. Um, that was like the first half of it. Um, and in that last section, they showed a map of exactly where the cars were going and where they got hit. And that was like a humanitarian corridor. Um, however you feel about this conflict, I wanted to show those two examples because PBS definitely showed both sides there. They included the statement by Netanyahu. You didn't hear an opinion by Shifrin about which side is wrong. He just basically said, this is what happened. This is what happened. This is what they said, but this is what they said. And the thing I really want to emphasize about how PBS covered that, and again, I wish I could play the whole four and a half minute segment, and then they did do follow-ups after that, is they included so much detail. And I think no matter, again, no matter how you feel about this conflict, the more you know about a situation, the better. Um, because if someone says, oh, but this, you have evidence, you have data, you have specifics to back up your point of view, right? And when you don't get anything, like Fox just made a vague statement and then had an IDF person come out in a uniform and, and give a canned statement that had already been taped, and that's it. That's all you got from Fox. And PBS shows you the route, shows you the car, says how many times the cars were hit, gives details about the people who were killed, shows Bibi Netanyahu himself speaking directly to a camera and his explanation. That's just more specifics, more detail. The point of news is supposed to be for PBS to inform its viewer, for me to inform my listener, for someone who's writing print to inform its reader. Uh, and I just don't think that anyone watching Fox would have any idea what's really going on in Israel uh, or with this conflict. They would just they're just uninformed, horribly, horribly uninformed. Um, and I, I just think they're doing a disservice to anyone who cares. I just think it's an absolute nightmare the way Fox has covered this conflict. They ignore it and then just every now and then try to use it as a weapon against Biden. And that's about it. And um, I mean, some of the more embarrassing clips happened at the beginning of this conflict when they had Israelis on and Israelis would start ripping on Bibi Netanyahu and the people at Fox would look shocked. Like, you don't like Bibi Netanyahu? And I'm like, 80% roughly of Israelis right now are furious with him because of what happened at October 7th. So yeah, they don't like him. And that's why people are saying, hey, hold an election early. There was just a huge, we're gonna go through it in, in the next section. There's a couple stories that address this, that again, if Fox actually showed its viewers the full story, um, I don't, I, and I don't think this, I'm gonna get worked up here, but I don't think that you have to pick a side with this war 
to show what's going on. I don't think you have to advocate for either side of this war to show what's going on. But I think no matter how you feel about Israel and Palestine or Israel and Gaza, people need to know what's going on. Ignoring it or covering up and glossing it over is not doing anybody any favors, no matter how you feel about this. It's just, I just feel like enraged by what I'm seeing. It just drives me crazy. And to give an example, last week, PBS spent 21% of its airtime on the Israel-Hamas war and Fox spent 1%. That's it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's terrible. So next up, we have stories Fox News ignored every week. I compare the hours I've watched on Fox News to five hours of the PBS NewsHour. The following list are stories that PBS covered that Fox News did not. We're going to start with updates on the Israel-Hamas war. Israeli forces left al-Shifa hospital after two weeks of battling with Hamas forces around the complex. During the fighting, around 200 Palestinians were killed, while hundreds were arrested. A second ship loaded with humanitarian aid and food arrived in northern Gaza. In Israel, thousands of anti-government protesters demanded early elections and the release of hostages. Israel suspended leave for all combat units in case Iran retaliates against an Israeli strike that killed Revolutionary Guard commanders in Damascus, Syria. Iran has vowed revenge on Israel for the attack. Following pressure from President Biden, Israel opened three land crossings into Gaza for humanitarian aid. Israel dismissed two officers and reprimanded three others over a drone strike that killed seven workers from World Central Kitchen, a humanitarian aid agency on a mission to feed Palestinians in Gaza. Israel said the officers mishandled critical information and violated the army's rules of engagement. Moving on to updates on the war in Ukraine. NATO allies agreed to plan for long-term military support for Ukraine. Ukraine. Ukrainian drones attacked a drone factory an oil refinery deep inside Russia. Ukraine has lowered the age for military conscription from age 27 to 25 to help replenish troops. Ukraine said it destroyed six military aircraft and damaged eight others in an airfield in Russia. Russia defense officials claimed they intercepted 44 Ukrainian drones and that only a power substation was damaged in the attack. A Russian drone attack in Ukraine's second largest city killed at least four. A missile attack in Ukraine killed eight and wounded 12 others. The Florida, and now on to like other stories, the Florida Supreme Court upheld a ban on abortion after 15 weeks. PBS produced a segment about navigating the SNAP benefits program, also known as food stamps, as part of its series on the American social safety net. The main opposition party in Turkey had major wins in the last national election. The election was for city mayors, district mayors, and other local officials who will serve for the next five years. PBS produced a segment that featured Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer as she spoke about the Michigan Family Protection Act, which protects surrogacy and IVF treatments in the state. The White House held a scaled-down Aftar dinner in honor of the Muslim holiday of Ramadan. Many Arab and Muslim American community leaders declined the president's invitation to attend the event. A fire at a nightclub in Istanbul killed at least 29. The club was undergoing renovations at the time of the fire. Managers of the venue were held for questioning. Three nonprofit groups, including Action on Smoking and Health, are suing the Biden administration over a stalled ban on menthol cigarettes. Uganda's Constitutional Court upheld its anti-LGBTQ law that includes the death penalty or ag- for aggravated homosexuality, despite widespread condemnation from rights groups and others abroad. Officials were able to open two alternate shipping channels around the wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland. The bridge collapsed in the early hours of March 26 after it was hit by a large cargo ship that had lost power. Federal prosecutors criticized the judge presiding over Trump's classified documents case. In an unusual order, U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon had asked prosecutors and defense lawyers to formulate proposed jury instructions for most of the charges, even though it remains unclear when the case might reach trial. 
Those records, prosecutors said, were clearly not personal, and there's no evidence Trump ever designated them as such. PBS produced more than one segment last week about Donald J. Trump's use of anti-immigrant rhetoric during his campaign. The former president has cast migrants as dangerous criminals and has said they are poisoning the blood of America. FEMA impl implemented the most significant update to disaster assistance in the last 20 years. The new guidelines should make it easier for victims of natural disasters to apply for financial assistance faster and with fewer rules, red tape, and delays. A federal court ruled that migrant children held at an open-air desert camps at the border need to be in safer facilities. The Biden administration bolstered protections for federal workers in case Donald J. Trump wins the next election. Trump has said he plans to have mass terminations across several government agencies. President Biden met with Japanese Prime Minister Fumo Kishida to discuss shared concerns about provocative Chinese military action in the Pacific. The two also discussed a Japanese company's plan to buy U.S. steel. President Biden opposes the deal. Experts are saying that Austria could be completely free of ice in the next 45 years due to climate change. All but one of 93 glaciers in the country have receded. Meta, the social media company that owns Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and WhatsApp, announced its new policy on content generated by artificial intelligence, or AI. According to the new policy, all videos and images created by AI must be labeled with Made with AI. A new NPR PBS NewsHour Marist National Poll found that 28% of Republicans, 18% of Independents, and 12% of Democrats agreed with the statement Violence might be necessary to get the country back on track. When asked, do Americans need a leader who's willing to break the rules to set things right? 56% of Republicans, 37% of Independents, and 28% of Democrats said yes. In the same poll, Biden led Trump by two points. Lou Conter, the last known survivor of the USS Arizona that was attacked on Pearl Harbor, died at the age of 102. Conter, who was a 20-year-old quartermaster at the time of the naval assault, was on the back decks of the battleship on December 7, 1941, when Japanese forces decimated the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And those are all the stories, there's a lot of them, that PBS covered that Fox News did not. Next up, we have By the Numbers. Every week, I compare the top five topics discussed on Fox News with the top five topics discussed on the PBS NewsHour. Starting with Fox, number one at 13%, Biden bashing. Number two, border crisis, 10%. Number three, trans panic, 9%. Then we have the murder of Officer Jonathan Diller, 5%. And blatant shilling for Trump, 2024, 5%. PBS. Uh, first up, Israel-Hamas war, 21%. Border crisis, 9%. The bridge collapse in Baltimore. They had a lot of follow-up segments about that, 8%. Artist profile, a staple on uh, PBS, 5%. And then author profile. 5%. That was just people talking about their books. Uh, for words used on Fox for the week ending April 7th, 2024, we have Biden at 365, Trump 284, border at 132. That's very high. Migrant 97, crime 76, economy 63, squatter or squatting at 43, The Rock as in Dwayne The Rock Johnson, 29, inflation 22, Israel 22, China 21, Iran 5, Hunter, five, and AOC as in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, three. So that's it for the news hour. If you'd like to become a paid supporter of uh, Decoding Fox News, you can go to my Substack for Decoding Fox News, my Patreon for Decoding Fox News. You can find me on Twitter, also known as X, Threads, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Also, Resolute Square has a version of this podcast on its um, YouTube channel. You can check it out there if you want to watch it on YouTube, even though it's just me talking. Hey, go for it. And the podcast mascots, Odin and Thor, also send their love. I'm exhausted. I'm probably going to collapse or eat something. I haven't eaten anything today. But that's about it. Thank you so much for listening. I will see you at the next podcast.
Resolute Square.